Hi, I'm Umbrian Libris, and welcome to my grand theory of Pokemon breeding and genetics, where I will attempt to explain everything we know so far about Pokemon reproduction and some related topics. If you've been with me for a while, you'll know that I have talked about this topic quite a bit in the past. And yes, I will revisit a lot of that old material, but I'm also going to approach it from a different angle and add in a ton of new information as well. And to do that, I've enlisted the help of my high school biology teacher. I'm Dulce Simas. I am a biologist, um, but more than a biologist, I'm actually a biology teacher for more than 30 years. So let's leave it at that. Mama Libris. Oh yeah, she's my mom too. I guess that's a credential too. <laughs> and my mom does not know very much about Pokemon at all. I just had this conversation with your grandma, trying to explain to your grandma what Pokemon are, um, or is, I'm not even sure about that. Pokemon would be more or less like the flora and fauna of this fantasy world. The game revolves around um, hunting these um, organisms or collecting them, maybe that sounds nicer, collecting uh, these organisms and training them to use them in battles against other of these organisms, depending on the organism and depending on the training that they get, they can have different levels of energy, different abilities and different things like that. I couldn't go much further than that. That would allow them to defeat others in a battle. I actually preferred to talk to someone that didn't know much because it meant that we could focus on the biology without being distracted by preconceived notions, besides my own of course, about how Pokemon work. It's going to take a long time to get through everything that I want to talk about, and so I've broken it up into three videos. This is chapter one, chapter two will be out in a few days, and chapter three a few days after that. For today, we're going to establish some basics, we're going to go over some terminology and some definitions, and we're going to make some very broad strokes conclusions about the nature of Pokémon as a whole. But we'll start by establishing the parameters of how we're going to approach this. First, as with most of my theories, I am only looking at the main series video game canon. The anime and other sources are their own canon, so Evidence that contradicts the game canon or that only occurs in those other sources is not super reliable. Second, I'm focusing on evidence we can directly observe. Pokedex information can serve as a starting point, but as I've established in the past, it's often inconsistent or self-contradictory, not to say outright unbelievable. So if Pokedex information isn't supported, at least, by observational evidence, it's out. We're also taking anything we can observe at face value, at least for the most part. A lot of the things we're going to talk about can be explained pretty easily from the point of view of the creators of the games. You can explain them as game mechanics, but that's not the explanation that I'm interested in. What I want to know is if we accept that everything we see happening in the games is actually happening in the real world of Pokémon, where does that take us? Can we then figure out how and why it works that way? Third. We're going to do our best to apply principles of real-world biology. The Pokémon world is a fantasy world, and so you can make up whatever rules you want, but the way that I personally prefer to interpret the Pokémon world is as a variation of our own. So it's just like our own world, except that there's magic in it, and Pokémon and some people are able to tap into that magic and use it to their advantage. But the real world is the only reference that we have, so we're still going to be working within the realm of Earth-based biology, of how life works on our planet. The way things work here is the only way that we know things can work, and that's still very broad and flexible. In the end, we're trying to understand something with very limited resources. We're trying to understand the genetics of Pokémon without being able to sequence any genomes. We don't even have access to the crossbreeding itself, that always happens out of sight, but we're going to do what we can. I want to start the real science-y part here by clarifying some terminology, because the games often use terms in confusing or incorrect ways. Throughout this theory, we will often use the incorrect game term and the more technical term sort of interchangeably, but we all need to be on the same page about what they mean. We don't usually talk about this in the Pokémon context, but gender and sex are not the same thing. 
Pokemon have gender variants and genderless Pokemon, but that isn't really about gender. Gender is more about identity and expression and cultural roles, so that doesn't really apply to Pokemon. What we're talking about is biological sex. It's the reproductive roles of those organisms, usually based on their genetics and or developmental factors depending on the species. Gender variance is really sexual dimorphism. Genderless Pokemon are more like sexless Pokemon, although that's not quite it either, and we'll go into detail on it later on. Another one is breeding versus reproduction. Breeding isn't entirely inaccurate, but it's a less specific term, since it can refer to anything from animals mating in the wild, to animal husbandry, to just crossing plants, with different connotations in each case. Whereas reproduction is more cut and dry, it's the production of offspring, that's it. The big and obvious misnomer is evolution, which is what in the real world we call metamorphosis. By definition, metamorphoses are just a series of very extreme, quick changes that happen to um, an organism after birth. And that's really broad. And, and some authors would say that every animal undergoes metamorphosis, um, including us considering, like, especially if you think of times like puberty, for example, where it's like it's big changes happening to, to the structure of the body. Um, but it, it's not what we usually talk about when we talk about metamorphosis, right? We're usually talking about things like uh, a butterfly egg hatching first, a larva, that we call a caterpillar, right? That uh, changes into a chrysalis, which is the pupa, and that's changing into the actual butterfly that flies around, right? So I think that one is the most dramatic example of, of metamorphosis, right? Because you go from an animal that feeds on leaves and so has mouth parts that are adapted to cutting leaves with a soft body, no wings, young organism, right? Immature, non-reproductive, right? Cannot reproduce at that stage. Uh, something triggers that animal to actually stop, to enclose itself in a cocoon. And then pretty much all of its body, the material that makes up that body is used and consumed in the production of a new body that has an exoskeleton, six legs, wings, and that feeds not on leaves anymore, that now feeds on nectar with completely different mouth parts and antenna and stuff like that. So it's, it's radical, right? I think that's the most classical example of, of metamorphosis yeah. there. And that's exactly what we see in Pokemon evolution. Quick, radical changes. Well, they're not always radical. Some Pokemon do just grow bigger as they evolve. But others can be really extreme, like Magikarp into Gyarados, or Trap Inch into Vibrava, or Ramoraid into Octillery. And in Pokemon, metamorphosis happens way more quickly than we'd ever see in nature, at least if we are to believe how it's presented in basically every medium. So we can attribute that to the magical side of Pokemon, but the principle of it still applies. Everything has to do with, with the way the genes are expressed in the cells of those organisms, right? All of our body cells have the same genetic information, the same DNA, the same chromosomes, the same genes, right? So what makes my retina, the cells at the back of my retina, be able to capture lights, different wavelengths of lights, and decode that into a nerve impulse. And what makes the cells in my stomach be able to produce gastric juice and not see the food, and my eyes are not producing gastric juice and hydrochloric acid, and that is not which chromosomes, which DNA, which genes are found in these cells, but which of those genes are being expressed, are being actually used? When we were an embryo, we were a mass of cells that were undifferentiated. Any one of those cells had the potential to do whatever that our body needed to do. 
And then as we start developing cells, we start specializing um, because certain genes are turned on and certain genes are turned off depending on the cell type. And hence we get to cells that can capture light and decode that and cells that produce uh, hydrochloric acid, among other things. If we take that to metamorphosis and, and, and then space this differentiation over time, right? The whole idea is this in principle, that at the larval stage, for example, if we're talking about a, a, what we call a holometabolous organism that goes through the full process of metamorphosis, all stages, right? So the larval stage, the cells are expressing the first set of genes. On the uh, next stage, the pupa, they will express a second set of genes. So some of those here are going to be turned off, maybe all of them, maybe some. Some are going to be turned on, but out of the same DNA library, out of the same DNA that stays the same pretty much the whole lifetime, right? And then when they, um, what's the verb for metamorphose <laughs> into the next stage, it would be yet another set of genes that are activated in that. So metamorphosis or Pokemon evolution is not a genetic change. It's an epigenetic change. It is a change to the phenotype of the Pokemon, the traits produced by their genes, as opposed to a change to the genotype, which is the DNA sequence itself. But what really causes an organism to undergo metamorphosis? A lot of it seems to be triggered by environmental factors, okay? Um, I'm not talking specifically about butterflies, but in general, right? Like uh, temperature and the duration of light and light dark cycles seem to be very common triggers in that process. Uh, we're talking about environmental factors that change the hormones that are working in these animals and the hormones then cause changes in the gene expression which may lead to more changes in the hormones so that you end up with a cascade effect which um, actually explains this um, positive feedback mechanism that takes the animal from one equilibrium to a very different equilibrium. Different Pokemon are affected by different kinds of environmental factors. Most of them require a certain amount of battle experience as represented by their level. But for others, it's their affection towards their trainer or the time of day or interacting with a certain item. The list goes on. But what I think is interesting is that evolution can happen at any point in the Pokemon's lifespan. You can leave your Grubbin as a Grubbin forever if you want, or you can quickly get it to level 20 and then expose it to a Thunderstone and then have it as a Vikavolt within minutes of when it first hatched. This is again way more radical than we'd see in nature, but the principle of it isn't entirely unique. There's research that shows that uh, you can keep an organism from undergoing metamorphosis by manipulating environmental factors. And actually there are also studies that show that you can induce metamorphosis of tadpoles, for example, by adding the hormone, the thyroid hormone is the hormone responsible. One of the hormones that changes uh, a tadpole into a frog is the thyroid hormone. So their experiments have been done putting the thyroid hormone into the water where the tadpoles live to raise the level of the thyroid hormone because they start consuming that and they actually um, changed into a frog faster, but it actually compromised their health. And that also has a parallel in Pokemon. We don't see this as much nowadays, but in the past, evolving your Pokemon too quickly did have some detrimental consequences like missing out on some powerful moves. When Pokemon evolve, 
Strictly speaking, they do become different Pokémon. So like a Steenie and a Tsarina are different Pokémon. This is established not only in how the Pokédex classifies them, but more recently in Sword and Shield with the ability to pass moves between Pokémon at the nursery. The Pokémon are basically tutoring each other, but it only works if they are the same Pokémon, like the same Pokédex number. So a Steenie and a Tsarina can't tutor each other, but for some reason Hoenian Lanoon and Galarian Lanoon can. I can't tell you why that is, because to me, two Pokémon where one metamorphoses into the other should be more closely related than two that share a dex number but come from different regions. It's like saying an adult Eurasian wolf and an adult Himalayan wolf, which are both subspecies of the grey wolf, are more closely related than an adult Eurasian wolf and a Eurasian wolf pup. It doesn't make any sense to me. We tend to talk about Pokémon species as in different Pokémon, different Pokédex numbers. But just because the Pokédex and the nursery mechanics treat them as separate, that does not make them different species. No, not at all. Not at all. A butterfly and a caterpillar belong to the same species. To make it very clear, it's because they have the same genetic makeup. It's the same organism. It's, it's like you trying to say that an adult belongs to a different species than that same adult when they were a baby. I don't think any, any definition of a species will ever, will ever get to that, so no. The classical uh, definition of a species is a group of organisms that can potentially interbreed and produce fertile offspring. All breeds of dogs are considered of the same species because in theory at least, yes, a Great Dane could interbreed with a mini pincher um, and produce a fertile dog, right, as a result. As a counterexample, you have the male donkey and the female horse, which I believe is called uh, mare. And when they interbreed, they can interbreed. They're, it's easy to imagine a horse and a donkey interbreeding. It's doable. Uh, but the result is a mule. And a mule is always sterile, meaning mules cannot make more mules. So that draws a line there saying that the horse is one species and the donkey is another species. Now, this definition of species has many, 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 many problems to it. What does that definition do for organisms that reproduce asexually? What does that definition say about things, about all sorts of living things, microscopic or not, like some plants and fungi and that, that can simply bud and produce another organism right there? And, and then how does that help us examine fossils and determine whether they similar fossils belong to the same species or not, because we have no idea of whether they would interbreed if they produce fertile offspring or not. Okay, so it's um, it's complicated. But the alternative definitions that I've uh, heard of didn't seem very practical, to say the least. You know. It talks about genetic similarity, um, which would mean we uh, could not observe a group of living things and determine from observation only whether those belong to, a sim to the same species or not. And that also complicates referring to different Pokémon as different species, because Pokémon can interbreed, and not just within their own evolutionary families. So a uh, Stoutland can breed with not only Lillipup and Herdier and other Stoutland, but with dozens of other Pokémon in its egg group, the field egg group, from Excadrill to Blaziken. And because some Pokémon are in two different egg groups, they create reproductive links between those egg groups. Like Runarigus being able to breed with members of both the Mineral and the Amorphous egg groups. That's what this breeding map I made is designed to show. The labeled circles have all the Pokémon that belong to a single egg group, while the connecting lines have the ones that belong to two. And Pokémon that are exclusively male, female, or genderless are also marked accordingly since it affects how they breed. The breeding map also shows that Pokémon that can breed with partners from multiple egg groups creates this enormous web that connects every single breedable Pokémon 
even if you ignore Ditto. Except for genderless Pokemon, but again, we'll get to that. By the way, if you want to download that in high resolution to study or to use in your own projects, there's a link in the description. So that really challenges the distinction of Pokemon into different species. If we stick to the classical definition of a species, and you have two organisms who can interbreed, and if they produce fertile offspring, this would make them the same species, right? Using the classical definition of species. This, this is how you would test if they belong to the same species or not, would be by promoting them interbreeding and see if the offspring is fertile or not, right? However, we now know um, that about 10% of all animal species, real life animal species, actually breed with other species and produce fertile hybrids. That percentage goes up to 25% if you consider primate species alone. We don't get to a practical, easy, you know, uh, definition of, of species once you bring in the exceptions, which I believe is why that definition of species is still there. So because the classical definition of species isn't really helpful when we're talking about Pokemon, for the rest of this theory, if we mention species, we're referring to Pokemon that either share a Pokedex number or metamorphose into each other. So they're part of the same evolutionary family. So all Meowth and both Persians and Perserker will all be considered the same species. And I think that's how they should be thought of in any situation. And Pokemon's ability to interbreed also brings us to another conclusion that all Pokemon need to be thought of as a single kind of thing. So we can't treat plant-like Pokemon as plants, and animal-like Pokemon as animals, and rock-like Pokemon as rocks, and ghost-like Pokemon as actual ghosts. No. They can all interbreed, so they all have to be the same kind of organism, whatever that might be. So when we look at more of the specifics of how Pokemon reproduce and what their genetics might be like, we're not going to hold ourselves specifically to how animals work or anything like that. We're still talking about it in the context of Earth life, but we're going to be looking at what is out there to figure out what could be possible. But that's coming next time. If you have questions about this chapter, let me know in the comments and I will do my best to answer them. If you enjoy this, make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss chapter two. And if you could hit the like button to help promote this video, that would be awesome. Thank you for watching, and thank you to all of my patrons, especially luxury patron Ethan Saffron. I'm Andrean Libris, I'll see you in the next chapter.